Well, as you know, I'm here to present the uh, Amy Goodman with the first Eye of Stone Lifetime Achievement Award. And I have to tell you, I was getting out of my apartment, waiting two hours on the, on the uh, tarmac to leave Washington to come here. But as I was leaving, I was talking to the, my uh, wonderful friend and super who's from Ethiopia. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm going to go to Boston and give an award to Amy Goodman. And he stood there, and he bowed. And I said, I've never gotten such a reception from him in 20 years of living there. <laughs> he said, she never moves. She is always there. Others come and go. But she is there day in and day out. He rattled off your call numbers. She is so passionate about issues, and she tells the truth. And so all I can tell you is that Kiros Hagos is a living example of the grassroots real people whom uh, you speak for. And I don't think I can get home without an autograph, so you have to give me an autograph for him. <laughs> um, you know, I've often thought that if Izzy could have cloned himself, he would have been replica replicated in Amy. <clears throat> in fact, in examining the similarities in both their large, impressive body of work, I'm not so sure he didn't. Among the similarities are their fierce independence their intense fidelity to documentation and investigative journalism, a love of the First Amendment and social justice, also an equal dedication to attacking secrecy and surveillance in government <clears throat> and attacking the lapdog of corporate media. One of Izzy's first taste of corporate media cowardice was in the 40s when he brought a black judge to the press club. And they sat there for an hour and weren't served. And so he, in great anger, resigned. And as a tit for tat, uh, when somebody wanted to bring him back in, they um, blackballed him. And uh, he, you know, he, he, I don't think he ever forgot that sense of, of cowardice. And, and he was forever railing against the mainstream media that would not cover racism. Would, went wholeheartedly for the Gulf of Tonkin crisis and uh, did nothing about uh, secrecy and surveillance in FBI and in the um, CIA. And he, um, during the blacklist days, as um, uh, Anna Marie alluded to, of the mid 20th century, as he, as he could not find a paper that would take him, and he always joked about these little ragtag papers and the precariousness of speaking truth to power. He once quipped, um, I always thought they would close by Monday, and they usually did. <laughs> so he started the mom and pop four-page weekly with his wife Esther, uh, lugging the weekly around in his car trunk to sell, um, and his desire to be so totally independent of advertising is very clear. And he once said, to sit in your bathtub and neither ask or want for anything, that is freedom. Um, he was the first to expose the Gulf of Tonkin lie, just three weeks after LBJ used a mythical hit on the American ship as the excuse that got the United States into the Vietnam War. He became a hero to the anti-war movement, and his circulation went up to 70,000, which seems like nothing today in a, in a, in a <coughs> media uh, internet world. But at $5 a year, that was $350,000, and he had absolutely no overhead. So as he said often, he loved to say that he was a very rich war profiteer. The sadness is if mainstream media had followed Izzy, they might have halted that disastrous 10-year-long war. Similarly, Amy Goodman co-founded Democracy Now! on Pacifica Radio 19 years ago this month as an innovative model for truly independent grassroots political journalism, which also included no ads then or now. It has grown by leaps and bounds, and today, Democracy Now! is a national, daily, independent, award-winning news program hosted by Goodman and John Juan Gonzalez, carried on more than a 1,000 stations around the world and at democracynow.org. It is funded entirely through contributions from listeners, viewers, and foundations. As Goodman says, we do not accept advertisers, corporate underwriting, or government funding. 
This allows us to maintain our independence. In addition, Goodman is an award-winning columnist and co-author of five New York Times bestsellers that always brings to her readers alternative voices often excluded by mainstream media. Mainstream media, in their idea of what constitutes balance, often means officially having two officials debating one another. That's not what you'd call a range. Democracy Now! actually hosts real debates, debates between people who substantially disagree, such as between the White House or the Pentagon spokesperson on the one hand and a grassroots activist on the other. Independence is never more important than now, says Goodman, for true democracy to work. People need easy access to independent, diverse sources of news and, and information. And she notes the last two decades have seen unprecedented corporate media cons consolidation. In the year 2000, just six corporations dominated the US media. However, Izzy saw similar repression of real news back when there were only three networks and a few newspapers that the mainstream considered important. He was forever citing the cowardice of corporate newspapers and networks for ducking the real stories. And um, he, you know, he, he uh, actually was quite marvelous. I loved writing about him, and I knew him uh, as a neighbor, and I uh, loved Celia. So I, this is a, to, close to my heart because he was fearless in his ability to uh, go after the things that other people didn't do. Um, and I think this is a candid view of the follies of PAC journalism said by Ted Koppel, none other than Nightline's anchor back then. He said, of the establishment media, we are a discouragingly timid lot. People whose job it is to manipulate the media know that. Many of us are truly only comfortable when we travel in a pack. Izzy was a genius and a scholar, but he also had a gift of one-liners that Stephen Colbert would envy, and he, Colbert, excuse me, and he constantly preached against such pandering by the press. Don't get conned by flattery and get cozy with officials, he said. You've really got to wear a chastity belt in Washington to preserve your journalistic virginity. Once the Secretary of State invites you to lunch and asks your opinion, you're sunk. <laughs> and as Amy Goodman knows so well, here's another line of his. You can't just sit on their laps and ask them to feed you secrets. Then they will just give you a lot of crap. <laughs> and Teddy White wrote all these fawning political biographies, and this is just such a zinger. He said, any man who can be so admiring need never lunch alone. <laughs> It reminds me of the modern-day TV blo bloviators who act like they're doing news and can scarcely get through a show without mentioning my close friend and fill in the blank with a political source. As Amy says about her work, these stories are set against the backdrop of the mainstream media's abject failure with its small circle of pundits who know so little about so much attempting to explain the world to us and getting it all wrong. Izzy put it this way about journalists acting as shills for self-serving leaks. Establishment papers undoubtedly know a lot of things I don't, but a lot of what they know isn't true. <laughs> and, um, you know, he, he was... Uh, I guess I have to sort of back up. I knew people in the mainstream media that absolutely appalled me, including one who was known the dean of, the, of journalism, who routinely played tennis with Poppy Bush, number one. And, I, and their argument always has been, oh, well, you'll get a scoop. Well, you only get what they want to tell you. And everybody should know that by now. But a lot of journalists, they, they can't resist that pull of having somebody come up to them and call them by their first name, not ever understanding that as soon as they get off the air or lose their newspaper, they're not going to be known at all. <laughs> but uh, So we've seen that, and, and Amy is brilliant in, in noticing that. And um, uh, Izzy was such a pariah because during the McCarthy period, he took on uh, J. Edgar Hoover and his racist and anti-Semitic hounding of innocent people during the 1940s, which included these questions of civil servants. Does he mix with Negroes? Does he have too many Jewish friends? 
Do you think he is excessive in opposing fascism or Nazism? Excessive. Did you ever hear him sing subversive songs? Um, but he paid a price for that. Hoover set up his guard dogs on Izzy, and I tracked 5,000 pages of FBI files on him that went for from 36 to 1972 when, when uh, Hoover died. And they have had such marvelous dis uh, disclosures as watching him go into his cigar store, um, taking down the license plates of people who came to visit their family, um, uh, writing such clandestine letters as uh, letters to his hearing aid company. And I think of all the taxpayers' dollars that were spent on hounding a man who thought and wrote everything he thought anyway. And uh, today we have the KGB inquiry still going on by right-wing neocons, and there's absolutely nothing in all. I've read, I read it all. There's absolutely nothing to, to uh, accuse him of any uh, of being an agent. And in fact, the great establishment stage, sage, uh, <coughs> excuse my voice, Walter Lippmann, spent more time talking to this uh, press attache, uh, who was also a KGB agent, than Izzy ever did. But for some reason, there's this let's go dog Izzy till, till the ends of the world stuff still going on in, with neocon writers. To find the truth, Izzy found his Snowdens in the, bowls, in the bowels of the government, hardworking, disillusioned men and women. That's how he got his major scoop on the FBI. He would be cheering Goodman's defense of Snowden and Chelsea Manning, now in prison for 35 years, for simply telling a terrible truth, showing a video of American helicopter uh, soldiers chatting away as they gunned down civilians just walking in Baghdad, including a journalist. I think there's something terribly wrong when he gets such a sentence and Snowden can't return to this country even after winning the Pulitzer Prize. Izzy sounded like Goodman when he used to say, without dissent, there can be no de democracy. Um, this is, I'm gonna get into Amy. I'm, there's so much about Izzy I wanna talk about, but I, I don't think I have the time. Um, <clears throat> Although Amy and Izzy both have a disarming way of speaking softly while asking the toughest questions, Goodman was attacked by President Bill Clinton when he called a radio station on election day 2000, thinking he was going to get a quick get out the vote message. Goodman challenged him for 28 minutes with questions about racial profiling, the Iraq sanctions, the death penalty, and NAFTA. Caught off guard, I mean, how dare a reporter ask questions. He said she spoke, quote, in a hostile, combative, and even disrespectful tone, period. And the next day she was banned from the White House. Well, that was nothing to what happened in 1991 while covering the East Timor independence movement. Goodman and fellow journalist Alan Nairn were horribly beaten by Indonesian soldiers after witnessing a mass killing of Timorese de demonstrators. They recorded this <clears throat> massacre in a multi-award-winning documentary, Massacre, the Story of East Timor. This time, Goodman was banned from an entire country, but she ignored that international sanction twice <clears throat> and was deported each time she showed up. And despite mass killings for years by the Indonesian military, the crisis was largely ignored by the media, media until Goodman drew attention to it. Um, I want to mention how her uh, strong fighting against the uh, establishment reporting of weapons of mass destruction uh, totally mirrors Izzy's reporting of the Gulf of Tonkin. Three weeks after LBJ used this as an excuse for starting the Vietnam War, he said, I've been looking at the after reports. He was an inveterate researcher, and he said, I see nothing. I see no debris after reports on debris. If we, got, if we hit something, shouldn't it have been known? And if the and again, there is this sadness of people who are somewhat on the fringe, which is that if the rest of the media doesn't pick it up and use it, it can sit there for a long time. And that is, of course, what happened with weapons of mass destruction when you had the New York Times leading the way. And this last story shows, I think, Amy's zeal and her sense of principle. 
1998, Goodman and journalist Jeremy Scahill documented Chevron Corporation's rule in a murderous confrontation between the a Nigerian army and visitors, I mean, and villagers who protested yet another oil spill that had not been cleaned up. The soldiers shot and killed two innocent protesters and wounded 11 others. Then Amy and Jeremy interviewed the survivors, some of whom had been tortured. The two journalists then forced Chevron officials to acknowledge that Chevron had requested the use of and had transported the Nigerian military troops to their oil platform, which was being occupied, the unarmed and hapless villagers. The Goodmill Scahill documentary, Drilling and Killing, Chevron and Nigeria's Oil Dictatorship won many awards, including the George Polk Award in 1998. Izzy had won a Polk Award, too, in 1971, but instead of being docile in a room crowded with establishment journals, he embarrassed them by telling just who the hell George Polk was, which most of them had no idea. He lectured them on how sacred cows like Walter Lippmann had swallowed whole the United States cover-up of just how the correspondent George Polk was murdered during the Cold War. He was murdered by the Greek police, said Izzy shrilly, still angry after all these years, who tried to blame it on the left with compliance from the United States, he told an uncomfortable audience. So this story sums up what I have Stone and Amy Goodman are about, and that is journalistic independence at all costs. One of the many awards that Scahill and Goodman received for the documentary Drilling and Killing Chevron in Nigeria's Oil Dictatorship was from the Overseas Press Club. The two couldn't afford the fancy dinner, so they stood in the back and seized the opportunity to question Richard Holbrook, Secretary of State, who was giving the keynote speech. The Overseas Press Club journalists, including Tom Brokaw, went ballistic. How seemly asking questions of their guest. In fact, they had capitulated to Holbrook, and as the club members huddled protectively around him as if to protect him from these two vicious reporters, they said, we made an agreement with him. He wouldn't have, he wouldn't have come here tonight if we hadn't agreed that journalists would, a, would not ask questions. A floored Goodwin said she was under no rules, and Izzy always refused background and off-record um, uh, meetings, and he would just wait around and get, a, get the scoop from somebody who'd been there and was able to use it and not be breaking any rules. And they were about to escort Scale out when Goodman shouted, release this man, he is about to get an award. <laughs> <laughs> but when it was her turn on stage, she told Brokaw, thanks, but no thanks, and did not accept the award. So, sounding like Izzy, she said they had to stand up to fight the cozy relationship between the media and sources. Amen? And Amy, here's this wonderful <laughs> award.